All righty, we are live on everything, so we are, are good to go. Jenny, do you want me to go ahead and start? Okay. Sure. Thanks, Corey. Yeah, welcome everybody. I'm so excited to have uh, folks here despite all the power outages and everything. Um, and thank you so much to Zaina for joining us. Um, so I'm just gonna do a little intro and uh, yeah. Um, Zaina Arafat is an LGBTQ Arab Muslim American fiction and nonfiction writer. Her recent book, You Exist Too Much, is wonderful. And it had a lot of acclaim as a most anticipated book of 2020. And the character in the main character is really complex. Um, and in an interview, Zaina was asked about, you know, this, this character is kind of hard to like um, and, you know, talk more about that. And Zaina said, I wanted to depict as realistically as possible what internalized homophobia could look like and how it could manifest especially when it derives from cultural and family taboos. The narrator's likability wasn't as much a priority to me as her humanity. And I think that really shows in the book. So for any of the master's students who are wanting to add a book, their thesis list that you know deals with a complex character and how to show that, this is a, a great choice. Um, in addition, she has had many uh, stories and essays uh, appear in notable publications like the New York Times and the Washington Post. And she's taught at many different places, including the University of Iowa, Sackett Street, Sackett Street Writers, as well as abroad in Jordan, Egypt, and Eritrea, and of course, now in Spokane. Um, and of course, there's many other lists of things that you could read um, on her website um, as far as what she's done, pretty amazing. And we're so excited to have you. Um, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And thank you for having me. Uh, I know it's been a rough week for everybody in Spokane. And I my heart goes out to you because it's already a tough time. And so I hope that power is restored um, soon for anyone that doesn't have it. Um, but anyway, but I am going to read um, for, uh, I'm going to read, I think, four excerpts. Um, and that will be like a total of maybe 20 minutes or 25, 20 to 25 ish. I'll start by reading. I usually don't like to set up anything. And actually, I'm going to start by reading the beginning. Um, and then, you know, the other four, the other three excerpts are pretty, um, they don't really need much setup, but maybe I'll give a line or two. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to read from the opening of the not starting with the opening of the novel. Okay. <laughs> Sip of water. Uh. <clears throat> in Bethlehem when I was 12, men in airy white gowns sat at a three-legged table outside the Church of the Nativity. They ran prayer beads through their fingers and sipped mint tea in gold-rimmed cups shaped like hourglasses, steam floating off the surface and up into the bright blue sky. I walked past them with my mother and my uncle as we wandered through the holy city. One of the men called out, Haram, forbidden. For the especially devout among us, it's Haram to eat meat unless the animal has been killed in a specific way. Haram to drink alcohol. Haram for a pubescent girl to expose her legs in a biblical city. It occurred to me then that I wasn't a flat-chested kid anymore that curves had begun to appear along the length of me. I was no longer indistinguishable from a boy child. What should we do? I asked my mother. I felt a pulsing lump take shape in my throat as I noticed her jaw extended and temples shimmering. My great grandparents' house was where we were staying and where all of my clothes were, 36 miles and three checkpoints away. I felt myself go cold as I closed my eyes and prepared to receive her reaction. I knew better than to try and preempt it with an apology. All I could do was strategically try to calm myself, to remember that the anticipation was heavier than the thing itself. I should have had more sense than to dress in such a way when we were visiting the birthplace of a prophet, albeit not our own. 
My mother had and still has a native's knowledge. She knows the rules instinctively in that part of the world and I only ever learn them by accident. Basita, said my uncle, it's okay. We approached the main door of the church and the men hissed again. My uncle ran the tips of his fingers across his mustache, then looked to my mother and me. Come, he said, I have an idea. We followed him into a gift shop just off Mangder Square. He dropped a few coins on the counter, then asked the shopkeeper if we could use his bathroom. My mother grabbed a Kit Kat off the shelf and tore it open, breaking apart two sticks without a second thought. My uncle dropped three more coins on the counter. The man pointed towards the back. My uncle thanked him and led the way. His master plan was that he would trade me his trousers for my Roxy surfer shorts. He went into the bathroom first and I could hear sounds of fumbling, his belt jangling as it hit the floor. He opened the door slightly and handed his pants to my mother so she could administer the swap. She then stood in front of me while I took off my shorts. Yalla, she said, her most frequently used word, hurry. I pulled on the pair of pants. They sagged on me. I had to tighten the belt buckle all the way up to the last hole and then roll the waist so that they wouldn't fall off, leaving me even more exposed than I had been before. I stepped out of the bathroom and looked at my uncle. I examined my new curves against his pasty legs, gangly and covered in sporadic patches of hair, my shorts tight against his thighs. It occurred to me in that moment to question why, as a man, his bare legs were somehow less troubling than mine. It was a double standard, a shame I had simply accepted until then. In acquiring my gender, I had become offensive. But as I stood in front of him, an unexpected pride began to swell inside me. I liked the way his trousers made me feel, like I could get attention from boys, from girls. I felt, for once, seen. Intiwelad Willabinit, are you a boy or a girl? A security guard at the Intercontinental Hotel in Amman had once asked my cousin Noor this question when deciding whether to lead her into the curtain-shrouded women's check for an intimate pat-down before she could enter the lobby. Bennett, Noor had responded, girl. She'd been insulted by the question, the uncertainty it revealed. But not me, not that day. Wearing my uncle's baggy trousers, I enjoyed occupying blurred lines. Ambiguity was an unsettling yet exhilarating space. As, I walked, as we walked back towards the Church of the Nativity, I looked at my mother and smiled, desperate for her to smile back, but she withheld. She offered only a freshly disconcerting look, squenching up her forehead so that lines appeared, her cheekbones protruding, her mouth forming a terrifying expression of indifference. At the time, I couldn't quite place the source of it. Had she noticed my contentment? Did it scare her? Only now, years later, do I think I understand. It was in that moment that she first realized I wasn't like her. The trousers were a demarcation line, one that separated me from my mother and her lineage. I wonder sometimes if that day was the start of something, whether it's when I began this habit of constant seeking, of endlessly striving to earn my way back a pattern that would send me on a misguided and self-destructive quest for love. I communicated something to my mother as I stood there smiling in a pair of men's pants, a message I didn't know I was sending her. She has always known first what I have yet to discover, has always seen it before I could. Look at me, I wanted to say to her then, please don't look away. So that's the first passage. Thank you. Uh, and then here is the next one. This comes in like chapter three or so. Um, and it's the narrator. Yeah, doesn't really require much setup. <clears throat> okay. Where do you live? Their professor wrote me. We'd met the previous summer, almost a year earlier. She taught French literature at the Alliance Francaise in Midtown East in between semesters at Columbia. On the first day of class, 
she had announced that past students had told her she didn't smile enough. So she put her palms on the edge of the desk and leaned forward smiling as if to say, here you go. I'd loved her since the day she kept me after class and suggested I was too harsh on Emma Bovary for her childish fantasies and for cheating on Charles. Emma's pathetic, sure, she said, pressing a polished fingernail to the word méprisable on my paper. From the dinosaur band-aid on that same finger, I surmised a husband and kids. But this is melodramatic, she said. She looked at me, paused, then offered an effortful smile. For the first time, I noticed the dimple that appeared above her lip when she smiled, like a second, smaller smile. While we stood there, I began to fall into its span. As I gathered up my things and walked towards the classroom door, she asked, is it so bad? I stopped and turned towards her. Is what so bad? To have an affair, she asked. Her question seared. It felt both suggestive and forgiving. At the time, a photo of Elliot Spitzer and his scorned wife, Silda, adorned the front page of the New York Post. I felt myself blush. I don't know, I said, but it is in this country. She laughed. Her laugh was deep and started in the back of her throat, getting increasingly lighter as it worked its way forward. True, she said. My body surged with heat. When I got home that night, I Googled her. I discovered that she wrote fiction. A short story with her byline came up, a simple piece about a woman struggling to keep her marriage intact as the other couples in their circle divorced. I wondered if it was based on truth and I searched for details that matched her reality as I knew it. During class the following week, I made a point to mention it. I read your story, I said, nervous to admit it and tingling with excitement, as though I had accessed some part of her that was now laid bare between us. Oh, she said. She nodded once, then offered the smile. Thank you. She appeared not to care whether I liked it, confident that it was good without my approval. Still, I felt encouraged to say, it would be nice to meet up sometime, maybe after class is over. She noticed, she nodded in return. It would. We met in early September at the Nespresso store in Midtown East, three blocks from our classroom. I showed up in a pencil skirt and a silk sleeveless shirt. The conversation flowed. She talked about walking her daughter to school, her husband's startup, their vacation home in saint paul de vence on the Côte d'Azur, I tried to match her level of privilege and exposure. I've been to Nice once, I said. I didn't mention that I'd gone with Kate, my ex-girlfriend, towards the end of our relationship. I was worried that as a straight French woman, the entire concept of queerness would make her uncomfortable. We ordered cappuccinos. I resisted asking for skim milk so as not to seem too weight conscious or too American. I felt slightly tipsy as we left, though I hadn't drank any alcohol. When the bill came, I hesitantly asked if she would send me some of her unpublished writing to read. She placed her credit card on the table as I reached for my wallet, waving my hand away. You want to read more from me? She asked, sounding almost suspicious. I panicked. Until then, I would felt emboldened, but her response was humbling. I thought I'd ask, I said, if that's okay. Sure, she said. She smiled again. It was starting to feel more natural any time she did so. I'm just surprised is all. We stepped outside the cafe and as we walked off in different directions, I felt overwhelmed. I wanted her, I wanted her life. I wanted to live inside her life while still living inside my own. I wanted above all for her to like me. Two days later, when she still hadn't sent any of her work, I followed up. Three essays arrived in my inbox that night. She seemed to be a guarded person, so reading her unpublished writing was like cutting to the front of a long line. She wrote about her French colonialist guilt, which as a Palestinian, I felt uniquely qualified to absolve. She wrote about reading La Fontaine fables to her daughter. She wrote about middle of the night despair, about wanting more. I couldn't believe how much her inner world resembled mine. The problem, as always, was asymmetry. Not only was she straight, but she had a husband to share her inner world with. I presumably had Anna's world, yet somehow hers was never nearly as captivating. I read each of her essays several times. 
They're nice, I wrote in response, still afraid to shatter a veneer of detachment. A month later, we went to lunch, but I couldn't eat. I wore a dress that once belonged to my mother, her gold hoop earrings, her Michelle watch. Anything beautiful that's mine was once hers. Now that I'd read the professor's writing, now that her sapphire wedding ring was refracting light from every surface, I was too conscious of my motions to land the fork in my mouth, so I just stopped trying. Sorry, I said, laughing dumbly. I can't eat and talk at the same time. She had chosen a place on the Upper West Side known for its burgers, but I ordered a salad. I imagined she was judging me in that moment. I'm familiar with that judgment, but still, how could I eat something so unsexy as a cheeseburger in front of the sexiest woman in the universe? She continued to look attractive and in control as she ate her burger, chewing with unapologetic authority. I had the ridiculous salad packed up, though I knew I'd never eat it. When the check came, I offered to pay. I'd looked up the place beforehand, cash only, and I fumbled self-consciously through bills fresh from the ATM. My eyes began to blur. I put down too much for the tip. We got up and left, and the minute she turned the corner from the restaurant, tears spilled down my cheeks. I was certain by then, I was certain that I'd given myself away by not eating, though I admit, by then, a part of me wanted her to suspect. Okay, um, I don't know. I'm just gonna read. Um, this is a an excerpt from a chapter that is um, based on the mother character and her sort of backstory and her life. So I'll just read a few pages from this. Um, as first ranked in her class, a distinction that still exists at the Quaker Friends School in Ramallah. Alia Abu Saab's firstborn daughter, Minister of Finance Khaled Abu Saab's first granddaughter, the owner of two highly pronounced cheekbones, and the first girl in 1960s Nablus to wear a London imported miniskirt, Leila Abu Saab was certain to have a great life. She was born in between two catastrophic years in Palestine's history, 48 and 67. The Six Day War broke out when she was eight years old. In less than a week, Jordan, Egypt, and Syria lost control of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, and the Sinai Peninsula. Another wave of Palestinian displacement ensued. The possibility of a state called Palestine receded even further into the distance, becoming nearly unattainable. The extent to which violence affected her childhood is unclear. She rarely speaks of her youth and never relates much information when asked. She recalls that on weekends, she and her four siblings would travel through three checkpoints from Nablus to Ramallah for two scoops each of pistachio ice cream at Rukab. She remembers that her youngest brother was sent to an Israeli prison eight times when they were teenagers the stays ranging from 19 to 45 days for throwing rocks at armed Israeli soldiers and trying to muster up his own resistance movement. After throwing stones at an IDF Humvee convoy that blocked a mother from taking, a, that blocked a Palestinian mother from taking her seizing child to a hospital in Jerusalem, he was placed in a solitary cell so small that he couldn't stand upright and had to remain hunched for an entire three weeks. After college, Layla turned down a slew of suitors, rich ones, handsome ones, good familyed ones. Though everyone expected her to, she knew she wouldn't marry for a while. What was the rush? Things were changing. Women no longer had to go straight from their parents' homes to their husbands anymore. In the late 1970s, the waves made by the sexual revolution in the States were just washing up on Middle Eastern shores. Against the return of the Ayatollah in Iran and the rise of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, the U.S. seemed like a bastion of freedom and liberalism. In America, she would be able to date whomever she wanted and not worry about her reputation. Play the field, her Harvard med school educated father told her. Go places and never settle. Besides, she'd spent the last 21 years watching her parents, her mother constantly screaming at her father, him trying to drown her out with his cardiology work, fellowships, Brooks, 
Layla wouldn't let that happen. She would never be like her mother, cleaning and cooking and using her kids as leverage against her husband, forcing them to take her side, a decision they would regret once they were older and able to think for themselves. No, she would never repeat her mother's mistakes, and she certainly wouldn't let herself be beholden to a man. She planned to get a master's degree and eventually a PhD. The thing about education, her father told her the day of her college graduation, which coincided with a sharp increase in Israeli settlement construction on confiscated land in the West Bank, is that no one can take it away from you. Everything else can be stolen. Everything else can be lost. Um, okay, and then I'm going to read, I think just one last excerpt, maybe. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, just one second. Okay. Good marking this one in case. All right. By mid July of my childhood summers in Jordan, I was homesick for America. I'd make a list in my journal of all the, of the things I missed most about the states peanut butter. Cow's milk, Nickelodeon, grass, Heather, my next door neighbor and best friend. From a distance, the US seemed so beautiful, so welcoming, so easy. How could I spend a minute unhappy there? I promised myself that when I returned, I would appreciate every little thing. This heightened fondness for the States lasted for the duration of the car ride from Dulles Airport to our house. The first night back in my bed always felt strange, like it was someone else's. By the time school started the next day, I was desperately missing Jordan. I'd long for nights on Teta's veranda, watching her lay out Arabic newspapers and roll grape leaves. The com combination of watermelon and halloumi cheese, fried falafel balls poking out of oil-soaked paper bags, roadside fruit tents with peaches spilling off the display and onto the earth, the sound of the three-stringed oud coming from the wedding at the nearby hotel, the sight of the greenlit minarets and the muezzin's lyric voice calling everyone to prayer. Above all, I longed for the smell of the jasmine flowers that were outside every apartment building, though curiously, I hardly noticed them when, while I was there. It seemed I could only ever smell them from thousands of miles away. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's nice. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, I guess you can feel free to ask any questions. Um, any questions? Zaina, thank you so much. That was absolutely beautiful. Oh, thank you. Um, so my my first question is, um, when you were you know putting all of the vignettes together and stuff, mm -hmm. um, what did that process look like as far as organization and, and just some of that structuring? Um, you know, did you struggle with that? Did that come pretty mm -hmm. naturally? Um, and what was kind of your thought process there? Um, so. Yeah, I close my eyes, by the way, when I think just to, for those of you that were in the workshop earlier, you know that, but <laughs> not everyone does. So no, the uh, structuring of the vignettes. So the book is like, there are a number of sort of vignettes that interrupt the present day text. Um, and these vignettes are often like flashbacks um, in the moments in the narrator's life or um, moments in just sort of history or her own or co her collective cultural history as well. And that structuring was really the chat one of the main challenges of the book so basically I just what I was I, I looked kind of nuts because I taped all the vignettes to the walls of my apartment um, and tried to sort of order where they should go within the present day text and the goal was to sort of show how moments in the past could shed light on the present and um, you know when when the present text was interrupted by a vignette 
basically the reader, I wanted that to be as seamless as possible and for the reader to sort of understand that this moment in the present is being informed by this moment from the past. Um, and that's why, you know, why she's behaving in this particular way. And, and I guess that that just took a lot of um, thinking about how, what particular moments spoke to what in the past spoke to what particular moments in the present and trying to make that work as seamlessly as possible and having like a sort of subconscious, you know, reference to this past moment without the narrator even necessarily realizing it. So yeah, that was a lot of, a lot of the work and a lot of printing of pages and taping them to walls. <laughs> So I'm interested in your being both uh, trained as a creative nonfiction writer, but yet you're you're writing fiction, and um, it has an I narrator, and and uh, there there is some similarity between the I and the and the author. Um, I'm just interested in in your thoughts on how writing fiction is different for you than writing creative nonfiction, and how having this experience in creative nonfiction has contributed to your ability to write fiction. Yeah, so I think that, um, well, what the part, well, I think that what's interesting about my experience of creative nonfiction is that I, I really like the shape, for example, of essays. And I think that's what I was really trained in was like, I mean, I think of essays as moving sort of like this, where you, you know, you have, narration and then you sort of dip down into um introspection or like analysis or perhaps like critical theory or I you know another sort of reference to sort of investigate this present moment and then you return and then you sort of dip down again and in many ways that structure I think informed a lot of my novel which doesn't have a traditional sort of novel structure of like going like this reaching a climax and then going like this um, although it, you know, overall sort of does, but it does a lot of this. And um, I mean, the fictional aspect of the, like the writing fiction was really great because I was able to take, you know, as you mentioned, like I myself am Palestinian American and LGBTQ. So I was able to sort of take moments of things that were real and go as far from them as I wanted to and just not be sort of um, fettered by uh, truth which was really liberating and just like fun to take things that I, that either almost happened or that I wanted to happen in my like and make them just happen um, and sort of investigate like what that would look like. And, you know, so, so yeah. Thank you. Interesting. Hmm. Um, I'm really curious about revision, um, mostly because I'm doing it right now and I am just constantly struggling with it. Um, and so I, I mean, you talked a little bit about the paper on the walls, but I just, I'm curious, like, where, like, how did you go like from first draft to next draft, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested and this may or may not apply to you. Like, when you have the kind of revision where you're like, wow, I really have to rethink this or restructure this or add in a whole new character or things like that, that just really, you know, make a shift in the text. That's hard. And like, yeah, the rev of course, revising was like, I mean, I feel like I wrote the, the first draft in like, I don't know, three months or something. And then I spent the rest, like many years revising it. And I guess, um, I mean, often I would just, I don't know how to answer the question because I, I think hmm, what I would do when there were these sort of major like overhauls was sometimes I would just start over. Like I would just even abandon the text entirely and start writing without trying to like free myself from what I had written before. And then, you know, kind of go back and meld what I'd written with what I had written before um because I find that I, I I myself like find that once I have an initial draft that needs a major overhaul I I, I I feel like I want to I'm sort of confined by that draft and I don't want to be but at the same time I don't want to have to reinvent the wheel of course every time and so I just like start without it 
maybe like re revive and and then once I'm at a place where I feel like I've feel liberated enough from it and I've like sort of moved enough beyond it that I can re safely return to it without being like constricted by it I return to it and I sort of like meld them together does that make sense <laughs> so yeah there was a lot of that and just like and, and then also, I mean, I guess a lot of revising was like deepening and and like further developing characters and just like lingering in moments that were sort of outlines, you know, as they were in the draft before and needed to be really like fleshed out. And so, yeah, it was just like sort of pushing myself to do that and not being discouraged by, you know, because you want to just be like, oh, it's perfect now. And he, that's what you want to hear. But then but then you don't hear that and that can be frustrating, but yeah. So also a lot of revision meant like stepping away in between drafts too and being kind to myself and like allowing myself to live life in between and like, um, like allow the feedback I was getting to sort of marinate in my head before I immediately tried to tackle it. Hi, uh, I have a bit of a follow-up question on the uh, revision process. And uh, I was curious if, uh, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of when, you know, people are working on publishing books about, you know, what it's like to work with an editor. And, and so I'm curious maybe what your experience was working with an editor, what that was like for you and, and, and uh, how that was maybe incorporated into uh, the revision processes, you know, you, you'd used on your own without maybe working with an, an editor before. Yeah, well, so working with an editor is really interesting. I mean, I chose the editor like to go with Catapult, which is my publisher, because I, I really felt like the editor saw eye to eye with what I would want the book to, like, you know, when I sold the book, before you sell the book, you have like a conversation with the different editors and they each tell you like their take on what they would, you know, revise about it or what they, and, and my editor, I agreed with a lot of what he was saying. He's also British and he had a different, the Brits have a different relationship to the Middle East than the Ameri than Americans. And I, I somehow um, appreciated his attitude towards the Middle East. I mean, the Brits are colon more colonizers, but at least they have a familiarity that like there, it wasn't, a lot of American editors were um, interested in like the book being more exotic and having more like, you know, spices from the marketplace and camels and blah, blah, blah. But with the British, I guess they 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 were over all that. <laughs> like the Middle East was no longer as exotic to them, so um, I was happy with that. But um, so we were I we were we saw eye to eye on a lot of things. But at the same time, um, and, and I find I found that as a first time novelist, I had to learn a lot about like holding your own ground and not feeling like, especially as a woman working with a male editor, like not feeling like you have to accept all the edits, which, um, you know, you, you, you can, you can say no to things and you can assert your own sort of vision because it's sort of can, there are times in a, in the text where the two visions compete with one another. So, I mean, for having spent so many years, like with the book, just by myself without an editor, um, it, it was a sort of weird transition, but also a really useful one because of course, like having an editor that sees, that's really smart and can help push the book to be better is great. But also like having to say, like having to learn how to articulate why certain things need to be there and need to stay or why certain characters should like behave in certain ways. And so that was, um, for me, something really important to learn and to like, um, and, and to like trust myself, you know? Um, because I think you can sort of lose sight of what it was, your vision when some, when you have somebody else sort of equally and not equally invested, but like invested in the book. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was really informative. Thank you.
Mm. Zaina, you uh, said years. Uh, so I'm curious on just what the writing process looked like and, and length of time there. Uh, how, how long did it, this manuscript take um, just kind of start to finish? And uh, what did that process look like for you? I think it took five years before, like, was it five? Five years, right. So it was, I started writing it I just woke up and started writing it like January 1st of 2012, I think. And then, um, yeah, it was New Year's Day. And um, as I said, I wrote the first draft pretty quick in a semester. And then I spent five years revising. And that meant I still was in workshops at the time, I think. Yeah. And so I was revising. I was like getting feedback from peers. Um, and, and then once I left grad school I I started a writing group or I joined a writing group in New York and then I was just workshopping more chapters with my writing group and then like my partner at the time was an amazing editor who really loved like she just really got the book and was an was just very very helpful in that the sort of revising process and then I at in 2017 so I felt ready to share the book with agents and I went out to an agent and she like got the book which was so cool to me because it's not it's like an unusual book and um and she saw she read it the way I would want a reader to read it and then we she had some edits I made the edits we signed and then a few months later we sold it so it was like five years writing it, six months between signing with the agent and then selling it. And then two years actually before it came out after I signed with the editor. But yeah, if I'd known it was going to be that long of a process, I would have become like a lawyer or something instead. But, but uh, <laughs> too late now. <laughs> yeah, I guess you have to really love writing to, to stick with it. <laughs> So um, going back to the question about um, fiction versus nonfiction, um, it's, I find it really interesting that you started writing this in the middle of your nonfiction program, yeah. right? Did I get that right? I did. did so that's just a kind of a really yeah. interesting fact in a way, I guess. And I'm wondering, like, do you, did you feel like maybe it, like it was a relief to write some fiction to get away from nonfiction workshops or just yeah, you know, whatever? I no, I did actually, because it was funny. I had a teacher at the time that I started writing this, uh, his Jeff Dyer, who, you know, he's a non, he's an, he writes nonfiction primarily. I, I think he's written a novel, but he was really into his criteria for um, <laughs> like what's good literature was like, is it boring or not basically? And I think he, um, his, that, was really encouraging to me because I was like, oh, well then I'm just going to write fiction because fiction and that's not boring. And, and he like really liked it. So it was very encouraging. And like, he didn't care at all that, you know, someone in his workshop was writing fiction, but he was also like a guest, you know, like a guest star professor that they was just wanted to be entertained. And so um, I, I found it liberating to be writing. And it was like, I think my last year at Iowa that I started writing the novel, it was liberating to be just writing fiction that was totally off the wall and kind of like inventing relationships that were to me fun to follow and that I could sort of like live vicariously through. I mean, so yeah, to be honest, like it was, um, it's kind of like that feeling when you wake up one day, I don't know, it's, it's been many, many years since maybe anyone has ever had, since anyone has had this feeling, but when you, you wake up and you're like, I can do whatever I want. Like I'm a grown up now, you know, like uh, that's what it felt like to start writing fiction. It was like, I can just do what I want. I can have this character behave in this way and see what that looks like and see what happens. So while also being true to like authentic to, what a kind of character with that backstory and that sort of 
the traumas that the character has had has had and just um that was really important to me um was like once i created the world i had to be authentic to it but i had total freedom to create the world i like that you know in, in our program people are like we do a lot of crossing over so you know we require people to take classes out of genre people are welcome to take workshops out of genre and that is definitely not the case at Iowa, right? Or it was when right. I was there, right? No, it's, it's not. like completely, I mean, that's why to me, it's really interesting that you would be in the middle yeah. of the nonfiction program, start writing a novel. That's, that's very cool. It was really rebellious and um, very typical of my nature, which is like very, for some reason, rebellious. Like if you tell me to do X, I always want to do Y, even if I initially was going to want to do X. So um, yeah, yeah, I didn't like how rigid it was in terms of like the, between the genres, it seemed a little, I don't know, ridiculous. I think it's cool that you guys encourage like cross genre and um, people to take courses in different genres. Zaina, along the lines of um, being true to like a character or a story, um, mm -hmm. I think I said this earlier in the workshop, I'm often finding, something I find for myself is sometimes I'm like, I feel like this is true to my character and story and nothing exciting is happening because that's what's happening for my character. Um, so I guess I'm just curious, like were there times when you were writing, um, you know, in, in the novel or elsewhere where you felt like, I want to be true to this character, but like, I have to change something for the purpose of like making the text engaging or, you know, some other motivation. I guess I'm just curious about when those things feel at odds and how do you sort of wrestle yeah. with that? I guess so. I mean, the closest I, I think I came to that was um, wanting, feeling like I, I wanted to be true to the character, but also wanting her to behave differently because as you mentioned in your introduction, like there are times when she's unlikable and behaves in really destructive ways. And that was, I mean, I, I'm somebody that, you know, it was hard, it was hard to create a character that behaved destructively um, to herself and then to others at times. But at the same time, like if I was thinking about her, um, trying to be true to the fact that like she's come from a certain cultural and religious background she has a certain degree of like trauma from childhood she has this sort of mentality about the world like then I can't in a certain scenario force her to make the right decision she has to sort of follow what would what a person with all of that would actually do until she can break out of that which like I guess that for me was the 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 closest I came to that um it was just like allowing the character trusting that the character letting the character exist as she would without trying to control her and trusting that 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 readers would understand that and um and that like I eventually all I could do was hope that she would break out of the pattern that she finds herself in without overly exerting influence as the writer which is a weird thing to say but but yeah Are you guys really all out of questions? <laughs> I could ask another. Um, so uh, one thing, you know, we've been talking a lot about sort of fiction and, and nonfiction and the, the boundary between that is, has always been really fascinating to me. Um, and, and so I had, a, I had a professor in my undergraduate uh, program who would always talk about in fiction 
uh, whenever something is like true to your life or very true to your life that you should try to like sort of move it away from that or sort of change a lot about it and sort of distance distance it from that like reality where where meanwhile if, if you're writing something that is really based sort of outside ex your own experiences you sort you sort of maybe want to do the opposite you want to maybe try to to bring more of those things in or to to your uh i'm sorry i'm getting lost my words but um you want to try and bring it closer to like reality um, and so I don't know if that made any sense. <laughs> I, I don't know if I paraphrased my professor very well. Um, but I wonder, you know, how was, you know, maybe operating within that boundary of fiction and nonfiction? Um, how was that for you? Were there parts of the book you were writing where you're like, oh, this, this is too much like nonfiction? Or, or did you have any experiences like that? You know, I, I think it's interesting because with the narrator, no, other than that, like, she shares my heritage and my like, I guess, LGBTQ status. <laughs> but um, uh, I like, I didn't just because, because I, I mean, I guess luckily I, I'm not that interesting as she is <laughs> or something. Um, uh, but with the other, like with one particular character, it was hard to, it took a lot of, stretching of like my imagination because it was based on a it was like the mother character um which you know a lot of the mother's backstory is based on my own mother's backstory and so I really that character was the hardest one to create um because of the fact of how much of my inspiration for her was derived from my own mother and so I had to really just do a lot of research to sort of give her a totally different backstory but that was also like in the context of Palestinian history um that would distinguish her from my own mother but also be historically accurate <laughs> um and so that one was really a challenge and that actually that character is that I think another in addition to structuring the novel like creating that character and really bringing her to life was the hardest part of the book and people readers always say they're like oh we want more of the mother like we we love the mother we want more and I'm like well that's the whole point is to want more of her because that's the narrator wants more of her as well um the mother is very withholding but but yeah so that's I guess in the case of that mother character that was the real challenge when it came to fiction versus nonfiction. yeah hmm. on uh, on that note did you ever um when, when I have characters kind of based off of family members or, or events within the family, I'm always concerned on their reading or anything like that. And so I'm curious on, you know, how you potentially navigated that situation. Um, was that something that, you know, influenced any decisions within the writing or did you, you know, draw that line that this is fiction and, you know, you kind of need well, to understand? Yeah, exactly. It was like, this is fiction for one, which it is. So it was, you know, but at the same time, I think, the way around the, the thing that I kept thinking was like every character I, I had to really fully especially characters that were based in like reality like I had to really fully like realize that character fully round out that character fully three-dimensionalize that character render that character in all of her motivations and to arrive at a place of like compassion and love for that character and I think that the motivations for when you use real people as, you know, basis of fictional character matters a lot, you know. Um, and so for me, it was really love driven. <laughs> and for the narrator, it was like the journey for her was going from a place of like anger and hurt from her mother to a place of compassion and, 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 and empathy and love. Um, but also like, I mean, I, I was scared like for the, like just even as just thinking of how like my community would like, it's a gay book, you know, and, uh, and, and that was scary. So of course, yeah. Yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna jump off that actually. Um, so um, when, when you were, creating scenes with the, you know, with your characters um, mm. leading up uh, uh, to, and at that moment, uh, the, the emotional 
um, mood that you've created in the scene. Uh, what tended to be harder to write as you started getting into, I, I guess, uh, more of the emotional detail, like, okay, this is what I've been, you know, aiming at. I'm going to try and get there. And now I'm there. When you got to the there moments, like now I've got to create this scene, what was the hardest part of, you know, uh, putting that emotion in there, I guess, is a way to say it. I mean, the way the wording or uh, the interaction itself or something like that. What was, what was the hardest part of um, trying to put it together there? Yeah. Gosh, that was a hard part. Like, well, for me, I never had a problem with the emotional aspect of it. It was like the sort of crafting the emotion into a, into art, you know? Um, I feel like I arrived at my MFA with a lot of emotion. And um, yeah, I definitely did. And then, like, of course, learning craft was the point of being in an MFA. And I suppose... Uh, I think that's where distance comes in, in a way. It's like you write a scene from an, I think you should, I, I believe in writing from an emotional place. Um, if you have that luxury, I, th I think it's actually, I've watched people that write with no emotion. I'm, I'm like, why, I don't get why you would write if you didn't have emotion. Like, why not just be a doctor or a lawyer or like anything else? <laughs> like, but I think, so I think it's a matter of like, okay, you write, Sometimes you, you write from a place of emotion, perhaps. Um, and then you step back, <laughs> maybe like a week, maybe a year, and uh, maybe a month. And then you go back and, you know, you have distance from the emotional core of the scene. And then you can really bring in the like craft aspect of it and maybe strip away a lot of the like stuff that came out on that first writing that was emotion driven. Um, and, and not even, I'm not even saying it's like, you know, you're, everybody's writing about their own emotions, but just like in fiction, you'll write a scene that's fueled by emotion because, you know, you're, why else are you, why you maybe want to investigate some emotion through the lens of like two characters. But I think it's a matter that's like melding the two together is what happens upon gaining distance and um, space and being able to sort of have the opportunity to, to, to just go back and revise the thing from different, like with different helmets on, like with a hel craft helmet on or with, a, with an emotional helmet on. Um, so for me, it was like, yeah, I feel like initially the book was just like a, for me, it was like a bleeding, pulsing heart. And then it became a craft like really I was obsessed with learning structure and craft because like it couldn't just be a bleeding heart but I wanted it to retain some of the bleeding pulsing heart so yeah <sighs> if that will make sense forgive me if it doesn't it's <laughs> okay <laughs> uh Zena I had a question about uh the narrator of this novel um I, I, there are times where she's uh, maybe not the best person. And I was wondering what are some of the things you kept in mind when working to write a character like that and trying to strike a balance? Did you ever find yourself thinking, God, maybe this is too much and this is going yeah. to turn my readers off? Of course, yeah, absolutely. And I I feel like what, what I tried to do was like just at the moment, hopefully when I risked alienating the reader, I would sort of, that's when I sort of swept in with the, uh, I guess some backstory or like narrator's sort of trauma or a very like painful moment that would then allow the reader to understand why this narrator behaves in like these ways that are distasteful at times. I mean, certainly. And, um, and so, and like, believe me that that's re that was really hard because I am, I like to be liked. I mean, like I like most, you know, like many people. And, um, but at the same time, I don't know, for whatever reason, I was very interested in like exploring what internalized shame and internalized homophobia looks like and where those things come from and how they can manifest. So I, I sort of had to like manifest the behavior and then allow for the sort of undercurrent of um, backstory and empathy and, and, and thereby you know, engendering empathy for her. And I think even sometimes in her like observations where that are 
I mean, even while she's behaving in ways that are like, I wanted there to be brush strokes there of like humor and which I think, and, and maybe just like pain, humor and like pain in her pain that she's experiencing that could also maybe engender some empathy for her. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were there any books that, that helped you with that, with the narrators who were sort of similarly um, hard to hang out with all the way through or like models you had in mind for that sort of thing? Yeah, but I'm embarrassed to admit what they are. <laughs> well, come on, you can tell us. I'll tell you one, but like, don't hold it against me. There's this uh, French, well, okay, Francois Sagan is one of them. Uh, she writes characters, she's, you know, she writes characters, female characters that are, um, I think, I think they're unlikable. And, um, and yet they're super like psychologically complex and thereby interesting. And then another writer who I'm really embarrassed to admit is this French guy. I like a lot of French literature, but this French guy named Michel Welbeck, I don't know if you've ever read him, but he writes these really tragic male characters that are pathetic in many ways and behave poorly, but also like, just, I don't know why, so uh, empathy inducing. <laughs> and so those, were, I read a lot of that I read so many I can't it's funny because unless my bookshelf is right in front of my face it's hard for me to remember all my like reference points but I do remember those two very much um and then also Bolaño was a was I feel like he creates characters that are kind of tragic and yet like lovable tragic but lovable <laughs> hmm. Madame Bovary, of course, she was a huge character for me. I, like that book was the, I mean, in many ways, like the basis for me is starting of, I, I love Emma Bovary and uh, she's a very tragic, but lovable character. Painful, but lovable. Zaina, I've, uh, as Greg mentioned earlier, uh, we had some of our authors come and, and talk after they after we read their book and everything in, in our uh, class last quarter. Uh, and one of the things I found very interesting uh, was the things that they struggled with the most um, mm -hmm. that, you know, as I read their book, I didn't necessarily see or think would be uh, an area that they shied away from in their writing, right? So one of them was, you know, she she felt like she couldn't write plot very well at all. And mm. um, I thought that she had had a great grip on it throughout her her book. So I'm curious if there are pieces of craft or, um, you know, just pieces of, of writing in general that you are intimidated by or, or try to shy away from at times, um, and then how you navigate and push yourself through those those areas. Good question. I think plot's hard, um, but plot is the bone you throw the dog while you rob the house. Uh, and so I guess I'm less interested in it as much as I am interested in robbing the house with character. Uh, but I would like, but now I'm writing a plot driven novel and boy, is it harder to, or it, boy, is it hard. I mean, this was hard, but like, it's hard to, like, yeah, I find plot to be tricky because it's hard to make things believably follow and to get the play, get things to go where you want them to go when they have to go somewhere. So um, for me, that is a struggle indeed. Structure is always a struggle, but who doesn't struggle with structure? I mean, that's like the work of putting, of writing really like, I mean, and then I mean, there are things I like doing, like writing scenes and dialogue. I love writing dialogue and interiority and all of that. But yeah, plotting things is hard. I never, ever outline anything ever. I mean, I barely have, uh, but, but I'm learning to do that because I think you kind of have to sometimes. So I just like to write and find out what happens next. But, um, but now that I'm, I'm trying something new. So yeah. <laughs> Ha, 
<laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I, mean, I like that line. Well, if we don't have any more questions, we can call it a wrap. But if you have more questions, jump in, speak up now. It's been really lovely to, it's been awesome, but I loved your workshop, like, um, was, I loved this afternoon and this evening and this intimate conversation. It's really, really great. Um, thank you so much. We're really grateful to you for staying up so late and, um... yeah, <laughs> sure. Oh yeah. Being so wow. generous. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I hope that um, one day we can all meet in person. It would be lovely to, um, I would have loved to come to Washington. To be in that yes. Washington rather than this Washington. I'm in DC. So I would definitely take, your, I don't know, actually, it's like here we have what we have. And then there you have what you have right now. It's, both the Washingtons are struggling. But, uh, but thank you for having yeah, me. Yeah, be careful. Be careful and stay safe next week. Man. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, fingers crossed for all of us. And where can we read the piece that you're writing? Oh, it's uh, it's going to be in a magazine called Extra. So. Extra. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Hopefully. We will look assuming for I go, assuming I, assuming I get access to the uh, inauguration and that it doesn't get too risky. But yeah, thank you. What are you going to do to keep yourself safe? I'm a little worried about you going right now. I know. The, the more I talk about it and the closer it gets, the more nervous I am. I don't know if I have the, the I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be okay. But thank you. Anyway, well, have a lovely um, weekend. Thanks, you too. Thank you. One thank more you. round of applause. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you so much for having me, Greg and Jenny. Oh yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for doing this. This was yeah, great. It's been lovely. So and 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 um.